things are meant to be. In the end, the call. In the end, the call.
Mm-hmm. All right. Welcome, everyone. Hopefully the music stopped. <laughs> That's what YouTube tells us to do. Get you here early and it works as we got um, a lot of people in the audience already. My name is Lori Jane from Simply Christian. And today I have with me David and Vivian Aspinall from Canada, and they are XJWs for over 30 years. And I have known them for, I think, about seven or eight months. Uh, I found them on YouTube when I was first waking up, and I was filtering my searches on XJWs with faith, and YouTube had recommended them to me, and I have loved them ever since. I reached out to them. They invited me to uh, their Bible study, which grew to attending several Bible studies with them. So I adore them, and I asked them if they would be willing to be interviewed, and they agreed. So here they are with me today. We have their YouTube channel and Simply Christian's YouTube channel coming together in my Facebook group. So we have a mixed audience. So please, any questions you have for, for David and Vivian, please put in your live chat box, and we will uh, more than likely pull them in and have them answer it. So I don't know, how do we start this? So uh, David and Vivian, who who wants to share their coming out story first or? I guess I, I'm, I'm nominated. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I guess I should start at the beginning. I was born in England, came to Canada, settled in Toronto when I was seven years old and had a fairly typical youth. Uh, got into the mid 60s and youth rebellion was happening. I had some Anglican background though. So I knew something about the Bible and what I, I did know was good, but what, what I did, didn't know was what was keeping me from being a fully committed Christian at that point. So when my parents moved to a different location and didn't plant themselves in the church, my mother was taken as when I was young. My mother was taken as, and, and the way that worked out was when we moved to a suburb of Toronto, I wasn't going to church anymore. I wasn't going to Sunday school. I was just a kid and I got into rock and roll and then into the hippie movement. And so by 1967, 68, we were fully committed to a musical career, a bunch, mim, a bunch of my friends. And uh, then I dropped out of, I got through high school, but I went to one year at Ryerson, which is now Ryerson University. Couldn't, couldn't get my mind around that. It seemed pointless to me. So I was gonna go into music. So I dropped out of college and we were headed into the world of rock and roll in 1968, 69, just before Woodstock. I, I read a book during that period, though, called Jesus Rediscovered, because uh, you, some of you will remember Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds. Mm-hmm. The, that was a, a, a quote based on a reference to the book of Ecclesiastes. So I was picking up bits of the Bible all the way through. And this book by Malcolm Muggeridge, a, a former atheist, by the way, who was one of the was a was a famous curmudgeon in Britain in those days. So when he converted to Christianity in his old age, that impressed me because I knew about him already. So I read his book, Jesus Rediscovered. He's, he also wrote a book about Mother Teresa, by the way, but I hadn't read that. Jesus Rediscovered, and that kind of set me up for the witnesses because he, he makes a good case for faith and how he rediscovered faith and, and he obviously was impressed by Jesus as I always was but he didn't answer all the questions a teenage boy would have. And that's why the witnesses were able to take advantage of that gap. There was only one religious person in my life uh, Mm. in those years. And that was a lady out of our 20 or 30 friends. She was the only one at a serious religious commitment and you can guess which religion that was. Mm. So she was a witness for about 10 years. And then she saw my interest and started answering my questions Mm. and got me in a Bible study. So by 1971, I was baptized and uh, was pretty zealous. So I started collecting books right away based on the references in the aid book. And that that just came out, by the way, the same day I was baptized, the aid to Bible understanding complete version came out. And I was witnessing to all my friends, the guys in the band. So several of them became witnesses in the next two years. So by 1975, Mm -hmm. we had about 15, 15 of the old gang who had become Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, that was great because 1975 didn't didn't register with me at all because I, I knew Jesus said, no man knows the day of the hour. Mm-hmm. Kept pioneering, became an elder in 1979, moved downtown where the need was great in Toronto, believe it or not, downtown Toronto, 22 mm-hmm. pioneers. Mm-hmm. And then we got married because I knew Vivian even before I moved downtown. She came downtown as well. We got married in 82, but then things started to go wrong because 
I had about five or six Bible studies during all those years. And some of them had really serious issues with the Watchtower's credibility about the past, but also about the false prophecies, also about issues like Israel's place in God's plan. So by the time 86 came along, I was seriously disenchanted. I, I knew I needed time to think. And of course, as an elder, I didn't have time to think. So I, 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 I decided I better tell Vivian that this is the, I'm gonna have to step down and reconsider a lot of things. And of course, this was a major shock to her. Definitely. So I guess I'll take up from there. Uh, first of all, my background, I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. My parents became witnesses when I was a toddler. So it's all I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And I believed it. And I was happy as a witness. I had no, no desire to leave it. And I, I thought they were right. So I was very convicted. And I, I would say that both David and me were core witnesses. We took it very seriously. We both pioneered. David became an elder. And so he was an elder when we got married. Uh, I just thought life was grand the way it was <laughs> as a witness. It was only when, when David said to me that some of these questions were causing him concern. Now, I was at some of the Bible studies that presented difficult questions but I, I would say the difference between David and me was I was more of a follower mm -hmm. and I was content to be a follower and I just believed that somebody had the answers so if a difficulty came up I would take David with me to the call <laughs> and expect him to give them the answer to their problem to their question so when he said that he was having some concerns over some of those questions I think I, for the first time, realized I had to make the truth my own. I had to be able to answer questions. I couldn't always just rely on other people to come up with the answers. Mm -hmm. So I, I gave David the benefit of the doubt, and I thought, you know, things would resolve and, and he'd be back in the witnesses. So when he said he was going to resign as an elder, I didn't think any anything big was going to happen from that. But I'll tell you, things happen pretty quick in the watchtower if there's any any movement like that. So they weren't too happy when he said he needed to think about things. They just like, what? Why would you have to think? And what's the problem? And uh, so I soon saw that this was pretty serious. And I begged David not to say anything, not to talk too much, but just <laughs> <laughs> to keep quiet. And then I was going to start reading and researching in the desire that I could resolve those problems. I could come up with the answers that he couldn't. So I um, <laughs> asked at the Kingdom Hall if I could use their library because they had an extensive library at the Kingdom Hall we were going to that had all of Rutherford and Russell's books and, you know, all the bound volumes. Uh, but it was particularly Russell and Rutherford's books that I wanted to read because I knew part of the problem that was facing us was some challenges a young man gave David about the the prophecies, the false prophecies of the Watchtower. And so I started reading those books at the Kingdom Hall. And then I discovered all kinds of stuff that made me uncomfortable. I didn't want to tell David that these things made me uncomfortable because then I'd be blood guilty if, if I came up with the answer later and he never came back to the witnesses. Mm -hmm. So it's a thing snowballed pretty quickly. So I did start doing the research. And at some point we started comparing notes with what I was finding in the books. And there was difficulties there too. I started to discover that they were not telling me everything about the past. There was cover ups and there was mm -hmm. deception involved. And that caused a, a, me, that was a big wound I would say for me because I thought they tell me to be good, to be honest, to be truthful. They call themselves the truth. Mm -hmm. How can this be happening in the truth that they would cover up their history, all the bad parts? So uh, I, I said to David, when we finally, you know, there was a period of time where we weren't really talking a lot about religion. It was too volatile. So knowing that it was volatile between David and me, when I did finally see that this this was a problem that I couldn't come up with answers for. 
I said to David, we have to be able to explain to my family and our friends why we're withdrawing from the watchtower unless they can come up with answers. So I thought the best way to do it was to, pr to put it down on paper, get all the quotes from the watchtower literature, from Russell, from Rutherford, and all the way forward, everything that we had difficulties with, and lay out the scriptures that uh, connected with it, what the watchtower actually says, and leave it to them. And I thought this would save us from being disfellowshipped. Well, it didn't save us from that. Just knowing it seems to be enough to, to get you disfellowshipped. So we yep. had 200 pages of documentation. I gave wow. it to two members of my family. And within three weeks, we were disfellowshipped. Wow. Yeah. That was 1988. We'd, we'd gone through about a year and a half of, well, like she said, it was volatile till she saw the problems were real and not mm -hmm. just in my head. And, and I knew if I tried to talk to my family, it would even be more volatile. So I thought it's got to be on paper so that they can look at it on their own without having to answer to me. You can do all your ranting on your own when you're reading the material. And but you you're honest, I think, when you're reading on your right. own, you have to resolve this. So I thought that's what I would be doing, giving them a shortcut. But her kid sister gave the 200 pages of documentation with the 10 page letter to the circuit overseer. We'd intended to send it to Brooklyn and to Canadian headquarters, mm. but it, it only got there later. I think the circuit overseer took, took it upon himself to go to our congregation. And that's when the yeah. judicial committee got going. Mm -hmm. So you were both disfellowshipped on the same, it was announced on the same night, both of you together. Yes. And we didn't mm -hmm. go to the, the meeting uh, be, because we had a few conversations with them over the phone, like joint conversations. And we said we would come to the meeting. First of all, we asked if it was a judicial meeting. And of course, they say, no, but it could become one. Well, okay, uh -huh. it could become one. So we said, well, we'll come to the meeting, but only if we can have my family there, all our friends, and the congregation. We want them to hear the whole thing. And the and congregation. Wow. Yeah. Any, any, all our friends. And I mean, we had a lot of friends. How dare you try and <laughs> do it the Bible way? Hundreds of people. So they said, oh, well, that's not the society's policy. Policy. Which, no. which the David, policy. David made the mistake of laughing when they said that. Yeah. Oh, that's not going to go over well. But really, it did sound ridiculous. How, you know, you can't recommend this in the awake as the, the way the judicial system sets things up and then not do it yourself. But they wouldn't do that, they said. Right. So we said, you, you'll have to have the meeting without us. So they just fell it. And you have a video testimony of both of your coming out stories, I guess, waking up stories on your channel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot more detail then. <laughs> yeah. So we'll share that. Let's um, take a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake Roberts is asking, how did leaving change your personal relationship with God? Did it feel any different? Good question, Jake. Mm. Well, certainly for Vivian, she, I think she had to reach rock bottom. Uh, although she had, I would say, a close relationship with Jehovah, as Watchtower would define it, as a pioneer and as a young lady, mm -hmm. and so did I, but but only by those definitions. So how did it change? Well, I think God watched her, at least, get to the absolute bottom of despair, mm -hmm. not being able to trust them anymore, not mm -hmm. being able to trust her family with information, not, not feeling she could share it, and not being able to trust me, and certainly not trusting anything that she gets in these books from Christendom. Yeah. That that lasted a long time, by the way. But but be, when she couldn't trust anybody else, she opened up to God, of course, and said, mm -hmm. you're going to have to help me. Yeah. I never lost faith in <clears throat> God, in the existence of God. And I actually, th I would credit the fact that during the time when we were having these uh, calls that were giving us uh, problems <laughs> or presenting problems to us, we had a, a young couple in our congregation. They were married, I think, the week before us. And we just, uh, 
he had been, gone to university. He was a convert to witnesses, and he'd gone to university and lost faith in the Bible mm -hmm. altogether. So his wife approached us and said, would you be willing to have a Bible study with us, like so that the two couples would be together and we could study together, and maybe she was hoping to regain her husband. So we said, yes, of course. And we studied Bible prophecy, not for the future, but how how uh, prophecies in scripture had been fulfilled. And this, David, uh -oh. would be a strengthening. It would help you to strengthen your faith. So it was things like uh, nations, what would happen to certain nations that are prophesied in scripture. So it wasn't Watchtower Fantasyland prophecies, but it was prophecies that prove that God is the author of scripture, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, worth having confidence and faith in. So I think it was that 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 helped me to hang on to, to God, because I could see in the Old Testament all these passages. Mm. And I just saw, oh, OK, I can I can believe that the Bible is the word of God. I can believe in God. I just can't believe in people. <laughs> so I I was very paranoid. I wouldn't. I wouldn't listen to anyone. I was. I just prayed to God and read my Bible, and I was reading the New World Translation when I left. But there's enough in there for you to find the gospel. Well, the gospel is in the New World Translation too. It's just, yeah. It's, it's just you have to know where to look for it. It's presented yeah. so it's, differently. Yeah. So, but Vivian, did you feel closer to God immediately when you came out? Did you feel a little lost for a while? Or did you feel uh, well, strong? I was, I was, uh, no, I wasn't strong. <laughs> when I left, I did not feel strong. Uh, I would say I, you know, I, I was completely relying on God because I didn't think I had anybody else. That's a terrible testimony, but <laughs> I had no one else that I thought I could trust. So mm -hmm. I prayed a lot during that time, but I was very depressed. I went into a major mm -hmm. depression for a little over a year where I just, I didn't want to be awake. I just slept as much as I could. I went for extremely long walks. I didn't want to be with David. I didn't want to be with my parents. I didn't want to be with Jehovah's Witnesses. I didn't want to be with anyone. So I was alone a lot of the time. And in that time I was praying, you know, for help, you know, to make sense of all this. And I'd say she was also reading the Bible as I was already yeah. before, before that reading the Bible with new eyes, I mm -hmm. Taking seriously what it actually says, as opposed yeah. to what the organization says it says yeah. it means. First and time without watchtower glasses. So what Vivian said about prophecy, well, then the other issues came in. Like, okay, if you believe that God fulfilled His prophecies about Babylon and Nineveh and Egypt, what about Israel? They're mm -hmm. the center of the picture, and mm -hmm. yet you you know how we treat all those prophecies as ours yeah. if we're in the watchtower. Mm -hmm. They're they're not ours. So. The, reading the watch reading the the bible without those glasses just taking seriously what it says yeah yeah i i could see continuity mm -hmm. now for the first time between the old testament and the new which i i never really got as a witness because you well you just don't read enough of the bible right. when you're a witness and as as to the personal relationship that jake is talking about well it starts with that do you take seriously what god says or do you de do you re do you recode everything he says? Mm -hmm. And and as as witnesses, we know what the answer is. You you're forced to redefine all the words, all the references. Mm -hmm. So it's, having a relationship with God means first of all yeah. hearing Him, and then of course yeah. responding. So my disillusionment with was with the Watchtower, not with God. I would say. All right. Mm -hmm. So Richard, our Bible study buddy. To David, what major doctrine did you question and reject from the Watchtower? Well, that's a that has multiple answers. I guess the first one, <laughs> the, the first serious one that was rocked was the the Kingdom nineteen fourteen combination. Mm -hmm. That was that was maybe my basic disillusionment. That this is I could see as as a troubleshooter in the Watchtower. This mm -hmm. is our foundation issue, and one of the Bible studies that I had during that period when I was thinking my way out, unintentionally, by the way, was I fell up 
who pursued this subject and wouldn't let it die. He mm -hmm. pursued 1914, Daniel, Ezekiel, mm -hmm. and, and as a result of, of going through those passages with him methodically, and Vivian was in on some of those discussions. Mm -hmm. His name was Raymond, by the way. We don't know where he is, but he was a really nice young Christian man. If you are watching this, please get in touch with us. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> but but in that in the course of about what five discussions with him mm -hmm. over over some food at our place, it became very clear that he was right and we were wrong. He mm -hmm. was making a coherent a coherent worldview, a mm -hmm. coherent view of prophecy and fulfill, prophecy still to be fulfilled. He was making a coherent case mm -hmm. that God was very serious about his relationship with Israel and if the kingdom is not 1914 then what is it I think he knew that if you knock 1914 out from under the feet of a witness that they would fall because so much was tied to that date mm -hmm. uh, you know the the FDS so the, he was trying to wake you up so to speak yeah mm -hmm. yeah I don't Good even job. know how you met him but a very nice man who who came regularly and and he pursued us. So I think he dismantled some of your prejudices about Christians not caring, not being uh, studious, uh, not knowing their scripture. He'd bring things up and, and he would say, when can we meet again? You know, <laughs> so he would take the... They were his return visits. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe God sent them. <laughs> I think yeah. So. He, I he was doing missionaries, missionary work with us. And we were downtown Toronto to do missionary work to, well, everybody, right? But so it, it didn't work sometimes. out that way. God had something else in mind, it seems. Mm -hmm. So here's a question from Richard to Vivian. What major change did you make in leaving the Watchtower since you grew up as a witness? Well, I guess the major change was I lost my family. And mm -hmm. I basically lost everyone I ever knew because all my friends were Jehovah's Witnesses. And my family, my personal family are all witnesses. So my parents and my three siblings and their families, because they were all now starting families. Uh, and I, w I don't know whether I really believe they would follow through and not have anything to do with me, but they did. They were yeah. loyal. They, they wouldn't have anything to do with me. I went through a period of time where I was sending letters and gifts to them and then the letters and the gifts came back. And then I was sending postcards because you can't send a postcard back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you, it's very hard to continue that when you yeah. get no response at all. Hmm. So I, you know, you know, I just keep them in prayer. But I've had uh, next to next to no contact with my siblings. And my parents did come and visit me once. Uh, well, twice, actually, uh, the first time, and it was such a shock. I'd had Max, um, and Max is uh, our son, and he came when I was 41. So I was 41 years old, having my first child, and they came to see him. So he was maybe three weeks. Well, no, I don't know. Just after 9-11, they yeah. came. Three or four mm. weeks old, and uh, so... I was shocked. David yelled up. I was upstairs feeding Max and he said, your parents are coming up the walk. I hadn't seen them in what, 13 years. Yeah. And wow. suddenly they're there. Uh, so we had them in and they, we didn't talk witnesses at all. Uh, just showed them where we were living and they were making sure that everything was okay. And, you know, talk babies. Yeah. We talked baby. <laughs> and Max was, was, uh, the second visit, they they came one more time when Max was maybe six months old, and he was so loving to my mother, you know, like it's Aww. just like you know how babies are, and uh, um, it was just very nice. That was beautiful. The the problem was that at that second visit, they were in our bookstore, and mm -hmm. they were surrounded by theological books on three sides. Yeah. So um, I think that that really got her father's goat. I, yeah. We've gone all the way from just apostates into Christendom. Yeah. Mm. So, but I don't know, like my, um, you know, I, maybe my mom just instinctively knew that would be the last time she'd see me because my dad left the place first. He, he left the bookshop first and my mother hung back a little. 
And then when she left, she said, you're a good girl. That's what she said to me. Oh, yeah. That's to me one of the most um, egregious mm -hmm. things that the organization called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society does to people. And they say it's a loving provision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got a question from A. McMahon. I think we know who that is. What made you want to start producing information and tracks for JWs slash cults? Well, when we left in 1988, we knew in advance that we were going to lose our jobs. So I'd already resigned my job because I, my, my best friend, the organist from the rock and roll band I referred to back in the 60s, he had become a witness and his three brothers and their girlfriends. So that was the 15 or pe people were all our friends. Well, that that man was my best friend still. And uh, I knew and he, he was going to, I was working for him for about three years before that in his piano business. He'd, he'd given up music, by the way, training at the Toronto Conservatory, the Ontario Conservatory of Music, which is the best place in, in Eastern Canada for learning music. He'd mm -hmm. given that up and his, be his best friend, Les, who was younger than him and also became a witness, also gave it up to become Jehovah's Witnesses about 1973. And, mm -hmm. and they'd gone into the piano business together and I was now working for them. But I knew the pressure from the elders would come on Val and Les to get rid of me when I resigned as an elder and sure enough that happened. And so I, I resigned my job and Vivian had to quit, I, quit I did hers the, too. The same thing because I was working for my father and uh, it, I was also preparing for a nervous breakdown, I think. So I even said it that way. Look, I've, I've got to retrain someone because I have to go home and have a nervous breakdown. Uh, and that's what I did. <laughs> mm. So I trained somebody to take over my job and then uh, I also knew they'd be under a lot of pressure to mm -hmm. get rid of me uh, because of that. So I, I understand though we're getting pretty far from the uh, question, <laughs> which is <laughs> That's okay. We we had no job jobs yeah. in in this is now uh, early 1988. So we decided to go into my favorite area, which was books. Um, yeah. So Vivian was running the shop, even though she wouldn't read the books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's and true. I, I'm reading the books. I, I've got a job, a night job as a night watchman, and where was, I can read nonstop, basically. Yeah, and he wow. was getting, like re-educating himself at, at his job, and learning. And his field of interest was specifically apologetics, so he had a lot of apologetic books. And we were regular garage sailors, so we'd go out looking for books. And we decided, well, why not use that skill? We know books. We'll start buying books and, and open a store. So we opened a store out of our house and we met all kinds of Christians. And one of the first Christians we met was into discernment ministry, helping mm -hmm. people who had been in a cult. So, I mean, that was just, just floored me that they were sent to us within, right to our door. <laughs> within the first six months of being in that business and being out of the watchtower, I think three of the people uh, attached to Christian Research Institute called CRI came, to, came to us and said, would you be interested in helping us with our ministry? I.e., you guys could help us reach Jehovah's Witnesses. And, sure. Mm -hmm. So we started going to their meetings and even conducting some of their meetings. And that's mm -hmm. that continued to be the case for many years after. Yeah. Giving them some inside intel. Yeah. yeah. And then you I get did, invited I, to speak at churches and and you know, ladies groups. I, I was going once a month to a ladies group and telling my story and, and giving them suggestions on, on how to reach Jehovah's Witnesses. And, yeah. uh, and that's you know, Austin's yeah. question about the, yeah. the information. Well, we started producing tracks when we got some computer skills and, yeah. and the tracks generated interest, more interest, and then turned into Bible studies of various types and training yeah. sessions. And, and some of that is now being, much of that is now being used on the channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. We had no idea that we'd be doing channel work. Like we didn't, even <laughs> have a we, we didn't even have a computer back then. I mean, that was. Uh, That's why you had to have Max to, to help yeah. you. That's yeah. Right. And he's interested in film. That's the only reason we're here. <laughs> doing this work <laughs> if you guys can you might need to turn your speaker down a little bit because i'm getting a little bit of feedback 
Okay, I don't know how to do that. Do you know? Mm. If not, I'm going to talk less. <laughs> okay. So Betty is asking, since leaving the Watchtower, what is your hope for the future as a Christian? And do you believe in the rapture? Well, the rapture, of course, is not a biblical word, but the, the concept I think Betty's referring to would be in Thessalonians, for instance, that one day Christ will return visibly and he will come for his saints and the dead saints will rise, I mean, physically. So a visible return of Christ accompanied by a, a glorification of the saints who right now are sleeping in death. So at that point, the, yeah, we do, we do believe in, in that, that the second coming will, will result in the salvation, the full salvation of the saints. And so the hope of the future, well, in that, in that, in a general sense, we are, we are, uh, what you would describe as premillennial. We believe there is a literal millennium ahead, but the saints are to live in bodies of glory, and Christ Himself will rule over the earth, according to this understanding of of prophecy. Christ Himself will rule over the earth. The saints will rule on earth, and there will be people on earth who are not saints. That is, the, not everybody will be destroyed at Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon in the Bible is a localized war. It's not a global war. So there will be survivors and they will come according to Zechariah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah. They'll, they'll come to worship the true God in Jerusalem year after year. And so that, that's our hope. The premillennial hope is, is that the saints will rule with Christ on the earth. All right. Good question. This is uh, next one's more of a comment. I used to watch Vivian and David's videos a lot as I left the JW madness. Thanks for showing what it means to be a Christian rather than the theocratic fascism we were used to. <laughs> yeah. That's from Theo. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Mm -hmm. And Miguel says, David or Vivian, which false watchtower doctrine took the longest to clean from your mind? That's mm, an interesting way of posing that question. Uh -huh. Do you have a nominee? Oh. I, well, I don't know if this answers completely. I, I would say the, the thing that took me the longest to, to get my head around was I couldn't, I couldn't understand what do I do with all those paradise promises that I believed in as a witness. So that was, that was the major one for me. I had a hard time giving that up because I liked the idea of paradise and and uh, being at peace with animals and people, you know, that sounded really idyllic to me. So that, what what helped me with that, I would say, was when I left the witnesses and didn't trust the Watchtower anymore, and I was reading my Bible, I went through the entire Bible without Watchtower glasses, and I marked wherever mm -hmm. I had questions. And then when I was coming across all those very familiar passages about Paradise Earth, I started to notice the context of, of where it was at, what, uh, who was it addressed to, uh, what does it actually say? It never says global. It's always talking about a specific place, Israel, their land, uh, you know, the, the boundaries that were given to them. All, all that helped me kind of resolve that problem. I would say that was the hardest for me to give up. I think Vivian's put in a specific playlist attachment to that yeah. subject. Okay. Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost playlist. Paradise Lost for Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 19 videos altogether on that list. Yeah. yeah, that's a good reminder. At the beginning of the chat, if you scroll all the way to the top, and I'm going to put all the links in the, in the show notes when everything's done processing, but mm -hmm. there's some um, links that they wanted to share with you guys. So it's the one labeled, what did you say? Paradise Lost? Paradise Lost deals oh, yeah. with that. So that's yeah. at the top of the list. Very good. Yeah. How about you, David? Yeah, that was a tough one, but I, I guess I resolved it before Vivian because I was having all these difficult calls with people who insisted that it had something to do with literal fulfillment of prophecy, Jerusalem, Israel, still, still in God's purpose, etc. So I, mm. I suppose the, the most difficult thing is getting past the barrier of what about divided Christendom? They have planted that idea that Babylon the Great, which by the way in Revelation is not 
an empire of false religion. It's an empire, all right, but not of religion. Babylon the Great is tainted when, when you leave, so, and, and their best argument seems to be the division. But we came to learn the hard way that the, the divisions of Christendom are, are apparent. But they're, they're really not real. At the bottom level, the, the great denominations of Christendom are agreed on, a, on the nucleus of the Christian faith, including the gospel, mm -hmm. which is that Jesus died for our sins and that he, he rose on the third day and was seen by 500 plus witnesses. That's the essence of the Christian faith, as 1 Corinthians 15 puts it. Mm -hmm. and, and all of the churches of Christendom agree on that. They, they disagree on a lot of other stuff. So I suppose that was the biggest thing I had to get past. Okay, what am I going to do with those divisions? They're very real divisions, but they're not on mm -hmm. the gospel. And how do you explain the things that they agree on when they're not even like one organization the way the witnesses are? And they, they lay out what you must believe. Now you've got a bunch of people who are in different denominations and they have the same core beliefs mm, hard to without any control from the other guy. How does that work? Isn't that kind of unity better than one that's forced on you? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So let's move on. Let's see. Fiona Gray. Hi everyone from the, she's from the UK. David or Vivian, what are your thoughts on shunning? I was attending meetings for about 18 months, but started to realize that shunning is not biblical or loving. Thank you. I hope that means you didn't get baptized, Fiona. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, shunning is unbiblical in the way the watch our practice it. Discipline is, by the way, discipline is a big problem in the churches. They, they err in the opposite direction. Most churches right. don't have much in the way of discipline. So that's not a problem in Christendom, really. It used to be. I mean, yeah, there's some truth to the fact that Christians have picked on each other over the centuries. But but in the, the world of today, there's far more ec ecumenism or ecumenicalism than there is persecution of fellow Christians. Mm -hmm. Chris Christians are being persecuted, but they're not being... They're not, they're not persecuting each other the ways they have in some periods of Christian history, and that's great. Mm -hmm. And that's a great contrast to what you experience when you, when you dare to disagree with the watchtower. We all know what happens. You, mm -hmm. you can't have a good debate. You're, you're gone, as we found out ourselves in 1988. I think the watchtower's form of disfellowshipping and shunning is mostly a control thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it controls their their people from hearing anything that would be critical. They have no capacity for self-criticism. So you can't have a dialogue on anything. You nope. don't even feel free to question anything or to ask, or say, I have a problem with this. I don't understand this. You can't do that. Or you might be threatened with, with being shunned by your family. I realize now that it was a very um, shallow existence. Um, I don't mean shallow, like in the typical sense, but it was, there's no depth to our life. Yeah. Um, even mm -hmm. though we were busy, 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 busy. So it felt like there was, but when you took a step back and when you woke up, it's like, and then you, then you got involved in what I call the wild, wild West. And you go out and you see all these choices and it's just overwhelming, but wonderful. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, that's why I, I yeah. wanted to create something like Simply Christian to help um, XJWs or people, you know, in any high control religion coming out to have a soft place to land, to explore their thoughts, to, you know, and all these questions that are being asked tonight. So hopefully yeah. you'll you'll join us there. I'll, I'll show the website at the end. Um, so we have a question from Mountie. I like, I like his M looks like an M&M. &M. I must be wanting chocolate. <laughs> have you had good experiences in churches since leaving? Yeah, we've, we've attended many churches. We've attended pro Protestant churches mostly, but we've also attended Catholic churches be several times because we have Catholic friends and we get along even if we disagree. That's the great thing about the churches of Christendom. We've, they've learned how to get along. As witnesses have only one way dealing with disagreement, and that is to shun, to get rid of you. And Whereas in Christendom, uh, even even today, I see there's a, a question up there that does does address this question directly from Ajram. 
you're mostly reading books from Protestant authors. And the direct answer to that is because those were the books that fell into my book collection early, mm -hmm. very early. They, uh, they answered the questions I had about Bible prophecy, for instance. I was big on the kingdom, big on fulfilled prophecy and the books I was finding were mostly from Protestant authors. But even since then, I've come to realize that there's precious truths being published by all kinds of concerns. Mm -hmm. And, and some of my best reading in the last 20 years since, since uh, I got deeply into Christendom and going to different churches have been from Catholic sources. So for instance, Raymond Brown and Joseph Fitzmeyer and John Meyer, Catholic authors, New Testament specialists, They've been among the most profitable books I've read. So there's great stuff coming from all directions, mm -hmm. except the cults. And I, I think for, for me, we wherever we live, we try and find a church we can walk to. and We don't drive. And we think it's a good idea to, to make it a local thing so that you're, it's part of your community. And uh, so where, wherever we've uh, attended has been because it is close by that we can get to. Mm -hmm. So that has, has left us with having attended a uh, United Church, very conservative United Church. Uh, we attended a, a Presbyterian Church, a Baptist Church. Uh, you the know, just depending on where we lived, we, we would just attend. And what I found is, or what I discovered is, we have to stop thinking that churches think like we did as Jehovah's Witnesses, they're not like us. They don't think, you know, you have to be a Baptist. You have to be, uh, you know, a, a Methodist, a Methodist in, in order to have the truth. And it's only them that has the truth. That's a watchtower thinking that, you know, God funnels None everything through one organization. Most of these groups, what they do is the mainline ones don't say you have to be one of us. So if I uh, if I happen to be living in an area where uh, there's an Anglican church, I can go there and feel perfectly comfortable. A Baptist church, I can go there and feel perfectly comfortable because they have the same gospel. The, cen the center of Christ and his death and resurrection for your sins. That's common to them all. The Apostles' Creed, if you look that, that mm. word up, either in our, in our channel or on Wikipedia, the Apostles' Creed is only two paragraphs and it summarizes what the churches have in common. They all subscribe to the Apostles' Creed mm -hmm. and that goes back 1600 years at least. And so any difficulties you have, and I'm not saying you won't have some difficulties, some of it'll be because of your baggage as a witness, but some of it's just interpersonal stuff, you know, like people are people and you know, somebody's gonna rub you the wrong way, that's gonna I've, happen. I've heard advice, it. don't tell them you're an XJW. <laughs> <laughs> just go and just just uh, say you're a Christian and you're looking around and checking out churches because <laughs> the minute you but, say that. But, but there is one caution maybe, which is there are fundamentalists in, in Protestant and Catholic circles, and that goes for the Eastern Orthodox Church too, which is huge. There are fundamentalists who stick by the old ways and insist that unless you join their group, well, well, maybe do it, do it a certain way. And, and, and so all of these denominations have internal squabbles going on between oh, the, yeah. the fundamentalist elements and the more liberal or moderate elements. And mm -hmm. so that includes the Catholic Church, by the way. Mm -hmm. Betty wants to know, do you think the PIMO JWs are saved Christians? So PIMO means they're physically in, they're attending meetings, but they're mentally out. I guess it depends what the PMOs are doing, right? <laughs> yeah, and why, why they're mentally out. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think it would depend on that. Because you know? we have some lovely PMOs in our Bible study who are, I would say, some of the best Christians around. You know? <laughs> I, so. I suppose it would, it would come down to the question of who do they trust? Because yeah. that's what faith is. Yeah. Who do you yeah. trust? And who's your, who is your Lord? And, and for the average Jehovah's Witness, even the one who has doubts, if he can, if he can trust God's word and Christ for his salvation and get, drive a wedge between that trust and his trust in the Watchtower organization, mm -hmm. I suppose you can say he's, he's made that necess necessary jump yeah. in his, in his yeah. view of the world and of what God is doing in the world. You've got to, like Vivian, 
testified before, you've got to make that jump sooner or later. And God will force you to mm -hmm. make that jump if you if you're a little bit reluctant. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you have a choice between the word of God and what the organization tells you, who are you going to obey? And that will tell you who you trust. Yep. All right. Um, Demez says, I may have missed it, but what was your response as a JW? What was your response as a JW when engaged by a well-versed Christian? I know the answer. They left JW. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I only met a few who knew what to do. Raymond, that Christian that we alluded to before, who mm -hmm. pursued the kingdom issue and Ezekiel and Daniel, etc. He knew what to do. He knew the vulnerable spot. But most most of the evangelicals I met, and they were the ones who witnessed to me, that goes back to Ad Shram's question. Why was I reading Protestant books? Because the people I was dealing with most of the time were Protestants in, in the Toronto area. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. the other Christians, the evangelicals I tend to meet, preach doctrine at you. They preach mm -hmm. the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and you always heard the same set of texts. So, and, yeah. so by the time I'd heard those texts 20 times, I was pretty ge pretty ready for any discussion on those I issues. So mm -hmm. Raymond, on the other hand, went in the side door. He, yeah. he decided, mm -hmm. no, though the kingdom is the big Jehovah's Witness issue. So it's that's that was his opening, and he used mm -hmm. it really well. So that oftentimes what, <clears throat> what um, evangelical Christians would do is pick the wrong topic, I would say, as David has said. They, they didn't pick something that mattered to us. They picked something that mattered to themselves. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're going to reach a person, find out what matters to them and dismantle that. Don't, uh, you know, if it's wrong, <laughs> dismantle that. Don't aim at something that's, that's valuable to yourself and maybe valuable to them as a Christian. But at, at the current time, they're, they're, they're armed to the teeth with, with scriptures that they've been presented they're just having an argument they're not you're not reaching their heart right you, know, you you have to reach the heart first they're unsaved people they need to know what the gospel is for one thing I present, don't, present the gospel to them i don't recall any of those well-versed christians that i met and i met quite a few and many, many nice ones too mm -hmm. uh, gentle ones that were more gentle than my pioneer buddies you know <laughs> More, more sweet-tempered than my pioneer buddies. Which but, is a but, good witness. But I don't remember mm -hmm. any of them focusing on 1 Corinthians 15. This is the great gospel text in Paul, anyway. And it's the one where we see the, well, the Apostles' Creed in germ form. This is These are the basic mm -hmm. teachings of Christianity. But for some reason, they went to the more difficult teachings, like the deity of Christ and, mm -hmm. and predestination. But usually it was the Trinity. Yeah. So Jean is asking, the 144,000 doctrine is a major doctrine for Watchtower. How hard is it for many witnesses to let go of that after waking up? Mm. It was easy for me. Psst, out the door. <laughs> <laughs> no two-class system here anymore. <laughs> well, I, again, yeah. in, in our process, it was, at least for me, just taking it at face value. There's only two references to the 144,000 in mm -hmm. the Bible, and they're both in Revelation, and they both are pretty specific. One says 12 tribes of Israel, lists mm -hmm. them. The other one says they're standing with Christ on Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of clues there that we've got the wrong view of the 144,000. Yeah, once you start reading the Bible and, and believing what it says, just taking it at face value unless it tells you to do otherwise, a lot of things get resolved pretty quickly. Yeah. And when I recommend to new ones coming out to just read the Bible and if if they, you know, start with the New Testament, do the Old Testament later but start with the New Testament, read it as quick as you can like it's gone with the wind novel and you can't put it down. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I did it in 6 weeks and that was only spending 30 minutes a day. So it can be done. You can do it in 12 weeks with 15 minutes a day. But when you start doing that and I I really wanted to know what it said to me. Um, not being told by any new people or or the Watchtower anymore, just what it said to me when I read it with the brain God gave me. And mm -hmm. reading it, I did not see a two-class system. And what I saw was Jesus talking to me. And, you know, I was a believer. And all of a sudden I realized that all this time that I was thinking the New Testament only applied to the anointed. Yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this applies. It was wonderful. So I think it's a fairly easy <laughs> doctrine yeah. if you're trying to reassess if you're trying to read your bible fresh 
it's a very easy one to debunk, if you will. And I always and recommend too when you go ahead. Sorry, David. I was just going to add that I, I should have said before that the easiest thing to debunk is is where the that hundred forty four thousand are and are going. Mm -hmm. That's that's an easy one. And the great crowd too. The, those passages go together, and it's easy to see if you take the word seriously. The great crowd are actually in heaven, and one hundred forty four thousand are on the earth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right, so we answered that one, and Tawana just wants to say, I love your videos. I'm using this opportunity to thank you. And my question is, can we pray to Jesus? Uh. Yeah, Christians are, are, are somewhat divided on this in terms of how they do it, but they all agree you can pray to Jesus. But but if, if you do a, a study of prayer in the New Testament, let's say in Paul's letters, you realize Paul habitually pray, prays to God the Father through Jesus, mm -hmm. and yet you have passages like Stephen and at his death, where he's talking directly to Jesus. So obviously, in certain situations of the New Testament, addressing Jesus and worshiping Jesus. This is I, I advocate for videos we did on Larry Hurtado. We haven't got them in the in the list mm. in the chat, but Larry Hurtado, his binatarian view, which is <laughs> somewhere in between, somewhere where most of us might be comfortable because after mm. all the Watchtower in its original charter said that worshiping God and worshiping Jesus were the goals of this organization. <laughs> worshiping Jesus is very much there in the New Testament. Now what you do with that is the problem and Christians mm. do disagree and that's okay. But Jesus centrality, obviously, can we pray to him? Sure, because if we can worship him, we can we can pray to him for sure. But mm -hmm. still, the path, the pattern in the New Testament is usually prayer to God the Father through Christ. I tell my kids when they pray to to God, Jesus is CC'd on everything, and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, like when we're learning about Jesus, we'll pray to him, and we know, you know. So at any rate, Grace Maid says, how did your Christological view change from Arian and what was the most significant impact on your relational communion with God and his son? Hmm. Well, I suppose I, I had to come to my present conclusions through phases and the phase one was Christ is obviously central. Even in the New World Translation, his name occurs 900 times whereas the name Jehovah has been inserted 237 times, I think it is, but with no, no backup, no, no, mm -hmm. no versions of the, of the Greek scriptures that we know of have the tetragrammaton in them. So what do we do with that when there's 900 references to Jesus by name and none to our Jehovah? We, well, sooner or later we have to change our Christological views. He becomes the center of the picture. He's, he's mm -hmm. the main player in the gospel. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, we can differ as to what that means, but we still have to observe that he's the he's the central character in the narrative. And uh, as long as Christians agree on that, I think there's hope for them because we can dialogue about the rest, mm -hmm. but we can't do what the Watchtower has done and move this this name into the center because there's no no precedent for that even in parts of the Old Testament. We just put up. A, a video in the last two days about the, the, that. Because the, the name, go ahead. The God represented by that name told us, "This is my son. Listen to him." <laughs> That's right. So we the really father, should do that. The, and the Father sent the Son, so He's not offended that you mm -hmm. love His Son, right? And He sent His Son so that we would have the ability to see Him mm -hmm. in in the face of something we could relate to a man. So. He's not offended if you, yeah. you love his son. My my kids say, Mommy, so I feel like you're for Jesus and Daddy's for Jehovah, because my husband's <laughs> yeah. still in. Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, if you're for Jesus, you're you're for Jehovah. <laughs> Cause he told us to. They're like, Oh yeah, that's right. So two for one. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin is asking or saying, I've come to appreciate being able to consider all positions without being obliged to accept creeds and confessions, even if I might come to accept them one day. Freedom, Christian freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen, Benjamin. <laughs> Grace made us another question. How did the breadth and width of your atonement theory change? And what was the impact of that on your heart? Mm. Well, 
in respect to the atonement, of course, everybody, every Christian group, even the cults have a version of the atonement, but we could, we could plainly see that the atonement in the New Testament has, has is more than a trade-off, i.e. it's not that God needed a new Adam and therefore sent Jesus. It's more than that because this one had to die not just for Adam's sin. It's not just a, a, a balancing of the scales as the watchtower always wants to picture mm -hmm. it. He had to die for the whole world's sin, and that's where Christology does matter because who is capable of dying for the whole world's sin? Obviously, mm -hmm. no, no just human can do that. So Christians have always argued about the, the atonement, and, and, and right now it's going on again, i.e. between the, the, the ones who think it has to do with blood sacrifice and those who think it's more about a more about Christ conquering as in John chapters 13 to 17 I have conquered the world so you can have different views of it but the point is they're all they all have a basis in scripture so yeah our views of the atonement went from he's a trade-off for Adam a perfect man for a perfect man to no he's capable of saving the whole world mm -hmm. wow yeah He's not just buying you a day at court. Yeah. So we have a lot more questions and I'm not ending it yet, but what I want to do is just take a break <laughs> and go to, I want to share um, something on Simply Christian and share your website with people. So let me just share my screen real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me take off Grace Maids. How do I do that? Row, row. Here we go. Okay. So now you should be able to see it. I just wanted to show everyone um, Simply Christian as a website, simplychristian.faith. It's basically a discussion board. And what we have here is a, like a general interest section, um, main room. We do a lot of kind of devotional and, and light encouraging stuff. Water coolers where we socialize our stories or our testimonies. We list all um, known Bible studies that would be of any interest to, to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or people exiting a high control group. And mm -hmm. um, David and Vivian's Bible studies are on there. Theirs are under the category called One Wonders. And maybe we can ask them about that name in a little bit. Uh, community resources, we share music, book reviews, we talk about science and faith, share artwork and photography. Um, we do have a support group for XJWs. It's called the Exodus um, Support Group um, for obvious reasons, your exit from a high control group. We meet every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'd love for you to join us if you need support. Here we post things about XJW experiences or rebuttals, YouTube channels, JW News. We now have a Bible reading challenge. We purchased a group license for the Dwell app. If you're not familiar with that, it allows the Bible to be read to you by professional readers and you can pick different versions of the Bible. And it really helps you stay on track because one of the um, steps I tell people when they're brand new and they just need someone to talk to is a number one, build your friend and support network. Number two, read your Bible by yourself with no commentaries, just Try and at least read the New Testament through as fast as you can. So that's why we have this Bible reading challenge to encourage you to do that and give you the tools to do that. Um, and then number three is to start attending, you know, Bible studies with other XJWs or other Christians. We have a Logos Bible soft, software user group. And here is One Wonders. This is a, in our special or in our interest groups, we set up a forum for those, uh, it says this, this interest group is for those that follow David and Vivian Aspinall. They have a YouTube channel. Here's the link. So if you have questions for the Aspinalls, if you come in here, I'll make sure they see it <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll answer them. But we've got a few posts in here. We're just kind of launching this. So we, we put up some of their videos that they've done and you can comment on them here or on their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Go back one. We have Spanish speaking forums, and then we have some, some private access forums, and then uh, Christian worldviews where we talk about different um, types of Christianity. So we welcome you to come uh, check this out. It doesn't cost anything. 
And if you register, you will also see some hidden forums as well that um, might not be showing here right now. I did want to show you the calendar. If you click on calendar, then you can see all the different meetings that we have. And there's a little filter thing here. And I'm going to filter on one wonder. So these are all the Bible studies that the Aspinalls are invi involved in. They have a Sunday Bible study, a Wednesday, and a Thursday one. So if you're interested in any of them, click on that link and it'll tell you how to get connected. You, um, you just got to email who the facilitator is and um, they'll they'll get you the Zoom information so that you can you can join us. But mostly I wanted to encourage you to, to take us up on that Bible reading challenge. You just have to register for the forum and send me a private message that you want to participate. And we have 100 licenses. We have 80 left. So um, we hope that you take advantage of it. And then here's their YouTube channel, David and Vivian Aspinall. We'll put, um, let me put the link in the chat right now. And these are all in the video description as well. I don't think that's the right one. Hang on. Um, so here, if you go to playlists, They've got everything nicely organized. Our son, Max, helps them a lot with this. And um, so you can look at all the different books they've reviewed. They've got, um, where's the one for Ray, Raymond Franz? That's how I found you guys. Should there's they, there's two. One, one is for Christian freedom. Yeah, there's That's one for In Search of Christian Freedom and one for Crisis of Conscience, mm -hmm. which is not complete. The other one is complete. The In Christian Search freedom. of Christian Freedom, we did the whole book. like We read through it. And then if you click on videos, you can see every video they've ever uploaded. <laughs> and of course, you can change it by um, oldest to newest or newest to oldest or most popular. Mm -hmm. So I welcome or invite you guys to, to subscribe and like their channel and mine if you haven't already. Because um, I think one of our friends said there's nothing like listening to Vivian read C.S. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, their book reviews are really, really wonderful. So, can I can anything I else? Put in, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to mention something that I always forget to mention. So, I've determined I should mention it for sure this yeah. time, which is we always forget to tell people subscribe, but also press the other button, the, the uh, bell. bell. The bell. So never, you. never done that. This is the first successful time we've done. It. <laughs> Become a bell. We're not good uh, promoters. <laughs> <laughs> but you've reached a lot of people. So, <laughs> yeah. okay, let's see here. Where'd we leave off? I think Betty, since COVID yeah. has stopped Kingdom Hall meetings and most people are home more, they have time to think and cruise the internet. Are JWs waking up and leaving Watchtower in greater numbers? Yeah, I certainly think so. I was shocked when we started the, uh, doing the, the channel because I, I was expecting my friends to be the, the subscribers, you know, like I was thrilled when we got to 25 people. <laughs> oh, okay. That's about it. You know, that's how far it's going to go. And then we were getting so many people responding. Yeah, you have 3,000 subscribers us. now. Wow. I didn't even know that. <laughs> 2.95. 2. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. So I, I never would have imagined that. So we have been praying for more than 30 years that something would happen to shake up the watchtower. And I think that's a fulfillment of prayer because I see so many uh, people leaving, but also so many people that are in there that are mentally out. Mm. So something's happening. That's the big difference between our ministry back in the nineties in Mississauga, Ontario. And now we were, mm. we were helping train Christians back then to reach witnesses because we couldn't talk to them. We'd done demonstrations by the way, at the sky dome, which was mm -hmm. a new stadium in Toronto at the time under the CN Tower. And we'd done demonstrations at, at uh, Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, but but we couldn't reach the witnesses in any way at all. But this this movement now is just thrilling that you yeah. guys you guys are all part of it. It's an age Well, YouTube who, didn't come out until 2008 yeah. or five That's or something right. like that. Yeah. I, I think it's been wonderful because it's enabled the, the ex-witness not to be so isolated because when we oh, left, yes. we, we thought we were the only ex-witnesses out there, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we'd never have a friend again. <laughs> that, that's the way you feel when you leave. 
And this group that we uh, ended up meeting through our bookstore, they were having support groups for ex witnesses. And I thought, oh, who's going to be there? Just us. <laughs> and they had people coming. And I was so surprised. It was so nice to, I think Misery Loves Company. So it was so nice just to meet a few other people who had sadder stories than mine. <laughs> but truth to tell, in that 13 years till Max was born, up till 2001, we probably had a, 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 a large circle of uh, two or three dozen ex witnesses that we'd yeah. met. And now we've mm -hmm. met, we meet that many in one month now easily. Yeah. 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 And you guys get a lot of emails, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So support each well, you're other. You get a lot more now because <laughs> your email <laughs> is in the show notes. So, you know, yeah. folks can reach That's you fine. through your email or they could go to the forum. Yeah. Be patient. <laughs> yeah. We will answer. Sometimes it takes a week or two to get back to everybody. That's the, the biggest drawback of all of this. So we'd have to mm -hmm. figure out a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. Got to clone you. So Richard is <laughs> yeah. asking, since you have accepted the Bible hope of reigning with Christ, what do you believe are the great crowd of Revelation 7, 9, since you reject the watchtower teaching of being a earthly, cl earthly class? Mm. Well, earthly class. No, they're in the book of revelation they come out of the great tribulation and that's one great difference between two camps of premillennialism i.e the traditional premillennialists as the early church was believed that the church would be on the earth believers would be on the earth during the great tribulation so the great crowd in revelation come out of the great tribulation they're not spared from it that is delivered from it by a rapture before the tribulation happens this is a innovation of dispensationalism which is now the most popular form of prophetic understanding in, in at least in North America. So we, one of our projects is to make the other view, the traditional view, the, the original view of the church more prominent in, in our dialogue with people like ourselves, with people like you, mm -hmm. who maybe have never heard this doctrine before. And I've only mm -hmm. heard the Watchtower version or the, the TV evangelist version, which is dispensationalism. The great crowd therefore are a, class of people who are saved during the great tribulation they're not an earthly group that live on afterwards they are they are in heaven plainly in heaven in both cases they're mentioned in the two passages in revelation okay um this one i don't know if you can answer which is your favorite author and book <laughs> mm. I, I yeah that's too tough so yeah, I, I was say, that's like picking your favorite child yeah. That's, that's, there's too many. But we could name a few Lewis names. has but. certainly blessed me an enormous. I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. I, I do. One one PDF that we should advertise, and I think Vivian's putting the chat up. I think Laurie's got it already. Uh, there's a there's a video on there called 21 Free PDFs, is it? Mm -hmm. And in yeah. that, we discuss the answer to the question, really, is, is a booklet that we put together 25 years ago called He Gave Teachers. Mm -hmm. about 140 teachers of the church that have blessed us that we can now pass on to other people yeah. from, from all denominations. Yeah. If you want a few names, though, <laughs> JC Ryle is one of my favorites. Alexander McLaren. Another one of my favorites. Walter Rauschenbusch. That's one of David's favorites. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the list could go on and on. Those are just the ones we're, we're currently doing series on. Dorothy Sayers is a, yeah. is a major discovery, by the way, for me. F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer Baptist. Uh, yeah, they mm -hmm. come from everywhere. So I've already mentioned Raymond Brown in the Catholic mm -hmm. circle. He's one of the great New Testament commentators of the last hundred years. Warren Wearsby is another one that I really enjoy. <laughs> yeah, Warren, if you go to the, their a, YouTube channel, you can see who they're reading and who they're sharing about. So that should give yeah. you some indication. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, there's a new playlist on there we just put on yesterday called Basic Christian Library. I think it's only got one entry right now, but we're adding <laughs> to it rapidly. And, and in there we put in some of, so far, my favorite books, but Vivian hasn't made any entries yet. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Janice says, we love your channel. We left four years ago, fourth gen. Wow. Due to their doctrine, now 68 and 63 years old. Do you believe wow. God still is in his rest? Hence, no direct involvement in earth and man's affairs. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> God is always involved in everyone's life. Believer and unbeliever is my point of view. 
Yeah, Christ, Christ is in the world and the Holy Spirit is in the world. So therefore, God, the Father is in the world, too. Uh, he's working. He's working. And as, as po John points out or Jesus points out in John, right? My father has kept working till now and I keep working. I think that's in John 5. So his answer to the Sabbath, the severe Sabbath keepers is, well, no, God works on the Sabbath, too. We should do good works on the Sabbath. So so whatever whatever your background on this, I think the answer is the the answer has to be that God is always at work in the world because he's omnipresent. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't there that scripture that Jesus said, my father's still working and so am I yeah. or something like that? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the so, Jam Jar said, David and Vivian, you both look beautiful. And I would agree. They got a new camera. <laughs> They're all sharp and in focus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and in color, did you guys notice yes. on their YouTube channel? Their mm -hmm. son had this, I think it was your son who had the creative idea to try it in black and white when they yeah. did the filming. And yeah. um, and a lot of people, when I was describing, I said, oh, I'm, I started to attend um, David and Vivian Aspinall's Bible study. I said, you know, they have a YouTube channel and they're thinking, I said, y y and they go, oh, the black and white couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how you're known. We almost <laughs> did you in black and white tonight, but the the new yeah. camera won't let you do it, right? <laughs> well, I don't know, but you know, I think Max just chose black and white as a stylistic. Yeah, uh, his very right. favorite movies, yeah. by the way, are in black and white, so he's prejudiced. There you go. <laughs> Actually, they, it hides a lot of sins. Black yes. and white hides a lot oh, of sins. Maybe I should. love it. <laughs> so does Zoom. Enhance appearance. I highly recommend it. Unfortunately, StreamYard here doesn't allow me to do it. So oh. this is the real me. <laughs> uh, Fiona says, which Bible would you suggest? Mm. Well, we've read through the Bible with Max since he was three. Every year we read through it once and we've probably sampled at least 10 or 12 Bibles by now. So my favorite that we've used, I think now for the third time is the ESV, which is not that old. Mm -hmm. The English Standard Version. And the New King James Version is excellent as well. The Revised Standard Version, that is the New Revised Standard Version. There, there's so many great ones today compared to, let's well, say, 100 years ago. She and asked why there are so many versions out there. Why do you yeah. think? Well, this is the, the, the Bible societies are doing their work. I mean, that's that's partly the answer to what the question that was just asked about. Is, mm -hmm. is God busy in the world today? Well, yeah, he's busier than ever. In the same period the cults grew, that is from 1840 to now, mm -hmm. in the same period the cults grew, as J.F. Rutherford himself pointed out, basically referencing C.T. Russell, the Bible societies have been out even longer. They, they started around 1800, and the Catholic missionaries were doing work before that. Mm -hmm. So God is busy in the world as never before, but so is the devil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, mm -hmm. all the translations in different languages of the Bible. So we're so stuck on on uh i don't know the western world we're always just thinking of our english bibles and the different versions but mm. people had to translate them into the languages of all people all over the world yeah. so i i think we you know we we can be happy that there's so many translations because i find when we read and we make comparisons from one year to the to the other of bibles we've read and we'll think oh i don't remember this exactly that way and we might go back and look at the previous one Sometimes it, it either makes you see something that you never saw before or better understand it because it's it's words that that register with you differently mm -hmm. than other words. So I think it's and a there's help. there's like um, more literal translations and more paraphrase translations. Yeah. yeah. And I and some in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I NIV is a nice compromise between those two ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, on, on subject of Bibles, the Jerusalem Bible is the Catholic Bible, but we've used that several times over the years for our, our Bible readings because, for one thing, it has the divine name in it. Mm -hmm. And that should please a lot of ex-Jehovah's ex Witnesses who think Christendom don't know anything about this. But not in the New Testament. Not in the no. New Testament, no. <laughs> no. I, I've been using the LEB for for that, the Lexham English Bible, for that very reason. Plus, it comes free with the Logos Bible software, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Idea Man says, what route would you take to dismantle the doctrine of the other? And then he had a second note, sheep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, the other sheep, if you just check any commentary yeah. on Luke 
or John in the parallel passage, the watch terror uses these two passages a lot, Luke and John's passages about the other sheep and the sheep not of this fold, etc. I don't I, I don't think I've ever seen a commentary on John or Luke that says what the watchtower says. They all say the other sheep are the Gentiles who would come into the church and be fellow mm-hmm. fellow citizens with the Jewish saints. Yeah. I, I don't mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've seen an exception to that. If you can find one, please let me know. So mm-hmm. so that's how would I dismantle it? Well that's where the teachers come in. So that PDF we advocated before he gave mm-hmm. teachers in in the group of 21 PDFs that are in that link. Uh, mm-hmm. That one for me is the basic difference between the cults and and the rest, the denominations. Mm-hmm. The, I, the denominations of Christendom tend to read each other's books. The cults read only themselves. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with the witness, they're always mm-hmm. thinking in terms of, you know, they, they don't think about the Jews separately. They just think about all nations. You know, so they they don't even separate it Jews and Gentiles. So I think your mindset is kind of like everybody, all just you know, pick and choose anybody. Mm-hmm. They're all the same. But in the Bible, there is a distinction made between Jews and Gentiles. So if yeah, if yeah. you know that, you're not going to stumble over this. It's mm-hmm. going to seem pretty. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. The Jews and the Gentiles. And it's still there in Revelation chapter seven. Mm-hmm. And when you do that first read through with no commentaries, of course, you're going to remember we just said this, but you'll see that. And it's like, wow. yeah. like, that's why it's so important to do that first reading. So you get your own personal baseline and then start attending Bible studies and hearing other people's opinions. But if you jump right in and just get opinions, you never get fully fed, you know, because even though they said in JW's that we were reading the Bible we didn't really, we didn't just like do a no. whole book at once. Really? So I highly encourage it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Carlos, yeah. in all the years God allowed you to be part of JW's, I love this question. What good things do you believe God wanted you to learn from that experience and how those times brought you closer to him after you leave? Mm. Well, I suppose the biggest thing we learned from our watch our experiences don't trust yourself because we trusted our own judgment for 15 years and ended up well we were in a cult vivian for a whole our whole life up to 28 and the other thing is don't trust men either so if you can't trust yourself why trust eight guys in brooklyn or ct russell and jf rutherford and mm-hmm. in effect we know if we're if we study the watchtower history that that's it you've got three theologians in the watchtower russell Mm-hmm. Rutherford and Fred Franz, and none of them were scholars. And that's the great flaw, I think, of the argument that you can just go to your Bible. Russell, I believe, prayed. Russell read his Bible, and so did his fellow Russellites, and they ended up a cult. They created a cult. So there's yeah. a fallacy built into trust your Bible because God never designed the Bible to be just private reading. In the, in the early centuries, the Bible was heard. It was heard right up until mm-hmm. about the Reformation. It was heard in community. We heard the Bible together, and then we shared. And and, and the, the one negative about having so many Bibles is it's too easy to lose community. Yeah. Mm. I think yeah. uh, just to answer Carlos, too, is is that I when I used to go, when I was invited to speak at different places, I used to start by saying, I thank God I was a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and that usually got some gasp in the audience of Christians <laughs> who were like, ah, why are you saying that? <laughs> because not just because it was in the past tense that I had been a Jehovah's Witness, but I think I learned a lot from having been a witness and left it. And I think it made me a more serious Christian. So I don't know if I'd been born and raised in a Christian family, I might have been rather fluffy, you know, like <laughs> I probably would have been a mm-hmm. fluffy Christian. I'm glad that I went through this painful experience. And Mm. it drew me closer to God and made me more serious and more compassionate for other people. I think going through that, you're humbled. And then you put your trust in the right place. You put it in God. And and you you will just be a better person, I think. Going through painful experiences is not all bad. Some of it is very good. I think there's some definite good to being a Jehovah's Witness. That's what I tell people. It's not all bad. I mean, Mm -hmm. one thing is... 
I handled the Bible. I learned how to flip through it and find things because I was not born mm -hmm. in. I was 25. Yeah. Yeah. So I got introduced to that. And prior to that, I was asking people that I knew that, you know, were Catholic or different faiths. And no one really mm -hmm. like bothered to teach me anything, even though I was literally asking them. But when it came to Jehovah's Witnesses, they did study the Bible with me. At least they introduced me to it and got me started. You know, I wish it didn't take 30 years so to get to where I am now, you know. But mm -hmm. okay, let's see. A little comment here from Faded Glory. Very grateful for Lori Jane, Vivian, and David, and JW Escape, Allie's Big Toe. I was so lost. Now I believe. Just have to get a foothold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I encourage people to look for these YouTube channels of XJWs with Faith. Um, when I first came out and went on Facebook and stuff, it was all, to me, it felt like most of the places I found were more on the bitter side and rightfully so in, in many circumstances, mm -hmm. but I could only take so much of that. And they were, a lot of them didn't believe in God anymore. And, you know, so I found that very discouraging. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of channels out there and that's why I'm doing these interviews so that people can see there's many XJWs out here with faith and come join us. We've got the discussion board. We've got lots of Bible studies. You don't have to be alone. The support group on Saturday is great to just emote yeah. and talk about what you're going through and ask questions. Like some people are like, should I fade? Should I write a letter of disassociation? So we can help you work through that and the ramifications. So, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to keep feeding negativity. Mm -mm. You know, you want some some positive happening too in your life, so that you you see there is a good life beyond yep. the watchtower. Grace made. I would like to thank the two of you emphatically for your even keeled temperance and literature recommendations. In particular, Vivian for the gift of suffering, which really mm. aided me in navigating. Oh, good. Mm. Oh, he's got more. Part two. <laughs> the existential <laughs> anguish of having lost most of my family and religious community. Your recommendations have filled my shelves. Much obliged. Oh, thank oh. you, Grace May. Yes. That's, that's, Very glad to that's hear that. wonderful because I was just thinking of the text where uh, when Carlos asked the question about suffering and what we learned most from that experience, well, it underlined that point in Hebrews 5 where I used to use this as a proof text, by the way, that Jesus Christ couldn't be who you you people said he was. That was where it says that he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And if that's good enough for the son of God, then obviously the rest of us have to learn mm -hmm. a lot of things through suffering, too. And I don't think this world sets us up for that. The Watchtower doesn't. They, they've got you being delivered through Armageddon any time now. And the world, of course, has its own view of that. In the churches is the prosperity gospel. God wants his kids to have everything. And then, of course, in the liberal culture out there that most of us grow up in, it's, you know, you can have the good life. Mm. So we're suffering. And what in, in God's economy, God's kingdom from the beginning, suffering obviously plays a major part. Every human being suffers mm. and dies. It helps you to grow as a person. Mm-hmm. Okui, I hope I said your name right. Jesus Christ is mediator. All of us are only the 144,000. Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy, there's one mediator between God and men, a man, Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that I take literally. There's one mediator appointed for all humans. It's just that some of us don't come to him. So, right. But there is a mediator for all mankind who want to take advantage of of that mm -hmm. offer, offer of salvation. Mm -hmm. M. Valoria, where would you go is not correct. You should answer who do you go to, not where. Bible teaches to worship with spirit and truth, not on a temple or location. Maybe that was in response to. Mm. Amen. I guess the link I posted earlier didn't work. I'll, I'll make sure I put a correct one in the, the video description. So if you come back uh, later tonight or tomorrow, it'll be all fixed up. The who you should go to, I, I can tell you a little story about, you know, when I first left the witnesses and one of the last conversations I had with my father, I knew he was going to say that, you know, where you're going to go to, where the best thing around. And, and at that point, I mean, I, I wasn't involved in a church or anything. I was 
very mixed up, very confused, but I was reading my Bible already. And so I had come to that passage about where should you, you know, Peter says, who, 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 will I, who will we go to? You have sayings of everlasting life. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember saying to my dad, I believe this and I'm going to go to Jesus. And even as I said it, I knew he's going to think I'm crazy. And he probably did. But <laughs> I said, I know it sounds hokey. But that's what it says to do. So I don't even know how it works, but that's what I want to do. And that's what I've told God I'm doing. I'm going to Jesus. You know, so I, I think that is the correct answer. Go to Jesus. <laughs> that we can agree. Thanks for, now uh, Jean says, thanks for introducing me to David Bourseau's book, A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. It's rare for XJWs to continue in the faith, much less delve into church history and write about it. Oh, yeah, I can say uh, amen to that. Thank you, Jean. Mm -hmm. That that book meant a lot to us even before we read it. Uh, that is before we uh, obtained it. Just to find out, by the way, David Bursow is on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You can look him up. He's an ex-Jehovah's Witness who has done this wonderful book that is un really unmatched in our generation. Anyway, a collection of all the early church fathers, mm -hmm. their quotes, just their quotes on all of the issues that you wonder about when you leave the watchtower. So that's one book we should definitely put at the top of the list of a book you will need to get you through those those 200 years when you think the apostasy took place. What were Christians doing and thinking and saying, writing and dying for during those 200 years from the so-called apostasy when the apostles mm -hmm. died until the Council of Nicaea? Mm -hmm. Bursault's work is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Richard says, thank you, David, for your answer about the great crowd of Christians are on earth during the tribulation. They also experience the persecution of the Antichrist. Thank you. You're welcome, Richard. <laughs> London says, do you recognize God's name as Jehovah or Yahweh? Since it appears Jesus never said God's name, but taught us to refer to him as father, a father. Well, Yahweh is much closer to the uh, the authentic pronunciation, but I, I don't think that the pronunciation is the issue. It's the use of it, the use of the name and what it represents. And in the Old Testament, it plainly represents attributes of God. And therefore, God is comfortable with not using it all the time. So you have Joseph not using it in Egypt. You have Daniel not using it in Babylon. Esther not using it, apparently, in Persia. So what's going on if you're a Jehovah's Witness? Mm -hmm. We've done lots of videos on on that oddity. I mean, the, I think the playlist that's up there, Daniel playlist, mm -hmm. if you go to the Daniel playlist, there's about 30 videos in there and that unpacks the issue of the, the use of the name in the Old Testament and why didn't Daniel use it, for instance, but also issues like the, the neutrality issue. The, what do you make if you're a Jehovah's Witness of Daniel working as virtually the third in the kingdom, mm -hmm. which means kind of like a prime minister? What do you think about that? And what do you think about Esther being queen in the court of Persia? And then the other issue in there, of course, is the kingdom in Daniel. So we recommend everybody goes to Daniel, almost the first book you should go to, because the witnesses really think they, they, they have a mastery of this book and they understand it. But really, it dismantles all their basic badge beliefs. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Question for the Aspinalls from Francisco. Do you hold to the doctrine of grace? Well, if, if Francisco, you mean, do we hold staunchly and strictly to Calvinist beliefs about the doctrines of grace? No, I'm not, I'm not a, an official Calvinist, but I love John Calvin. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess I'm caught somewhere in between because I don't think there's one pattern of theology in the New Testament itself, whereas those who do will want to pick a system, whether it be an Arminian system like Wesleyanism or, or one of the Calvinist systems that divide much of Western English speaking Christendom right now. So the, the more separatist Calvinists tend to be very, very strict in their doctrine. I understand that because I've had moments like that in my Christian walk too. But right now, I believe the New Testament is diverse. So the New Testament itself leads, has several trajectories leading out of it. And some lead in, some lead in a Calvinist direction, direction for instance, the Gospel of John, but some don't. And the Gospel of Matthew is prominent among that number. So leaving Calvin out of it, I would say um, that grace, the, the definition 
for grace that the watchtower translates theirs as undeserved kindness is not a bad translation. It is undeserved. So anything that we get from God is undeserved. So I believe in grace. All right. <laughs> Betty says, Watchtower is in damage control this week. The watch, the watch our meeting is especially strong warning against apostates. I believe the Holy Spirit is working overtime, thus more leaving. Praise God. Yeah, yes, a lot, of, God. lot mm -hmm. of apostate talk. So we're, <laughs> we're making a dent, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, part two, left his vineyard. Left and found they were not doing as directed when Jesus comes back serving on the owner's behalf. So expelled the caretakers who were supposed to look after. Okay, maybe I missed part one of hers, Janice. Yeah. Oh, yes, here we go. Her first part was, we do believe the reason we asked was because of what atheists use. What about all the suffering in the world? Why has God not stopped? It's my conclusion for example, the parable of the master going abroad. And then part two, <clears throat> left his vineyard, left and found they were not doing as directed when Jesus comes back serving on the owner's behalf. And is there a question in here? Mm. So, Maybe she's... Yeah. I'm familiar with the passage she's talking about and the, the witnesses have it. Uh, well, maybe you should comment on it. On the venue? Yeah, that passage of scripture. You know about I, the I, suffering of what atheists with the witnesses. Means. With the witnesses, they they basically would have the parable run with with God destroying the vineyard. Mm. You know, if the vineyard are God's people, he he throws out the the ones that are taking care of the vineyard and not doing a good job abusing the 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 people in the vineyard. He doesn't destroy the, the whole vineyard. That's mm. basically the way the watchtower has it. There's an apostasy comes in and he, you know, he just destroys the whole vineyard. Well, what sense does that make? I think I could put a plug in for Vivian's series that now runs to what, 22 videos on, on John Wenham's book. Mm. John Wenham's book, The Goodness of God, takes care of a lot of these objections that atheists constantly throw at the, the church about suffering. And John Wenham, I think, has done it as well as anyone. But but Vivian's also done a series on C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, where he wrestled with that because he was mm -hmm. an atheist when he was a young man. He mm -hmm. had to deal with all of the questions that everybody always brings up in mm -hmm. objection to Christianity. And suffering is probably the foremost one, right? And there's lots of books by a lot of Christians on on the topic of suffering and and pain and, and the, the objections people throw at the Bible. And the usual answer that is given, and I'm not very happy with many of the answers, but the one I'm happiest with, because I don't think the Bible directly answers this head on, except in the cross. Mm. That if, if Christ himself comes to the earth and God the Father and Christ are happy that Christ should suffer, not just as an example for the rest of us, but as the central symbol of, of what, what reality is, i.e. the cross, Mm -hmm. symbolizes that there is no path to God except through suffering. So if that's the case, even for the Son of God, then I guess the rest of us mm -hmm. can get past our our feelings on this issue because nobody likes to see other people suffer. Nobody likes even to see an animal suffer. But the, the groaning that Paul talks about in Romans 8 for me is, is a great passage because he says that because of our sin, the whole creation is groaning together. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to separate one of us from each other so that we get exactly what we deserve individually. God has created us in community and not only that, but he's given us dominion over the whole creation, at least mm -hmm. the earthly part of it. And, and therefore the creation itself suffers with us. So Paul for me in Romans eight is very profound about the, the implications of suffering that God has so created the world that we can't live without each other. Mm -hmm. All right. Fiona says, David and Vivian, you mentioned ESV Bible. I realize Mark 9, 44 and 46 are missing, although these verses are in the King James Version. Do you know why? Thank you for answering my previous questions. We get a lot of uh, objections from people who are affiliated with the King James Only movement. I, mm -hmm. I think some of you know what we're talking about. You've had personal experience with it. 
it's very tempting to think that there's one Bible that God has to use because it's basically a kind of an extension of the idea that we need an infallible source. So James White, if, if you if you do YouTube, look up James White and some of the debates he's done with King James only people because you get the impression from a lot of YouTube videos that it's the new Bibles that have the problem. They've taken stuff out of the text. No, the King James had great men uh, who are attached to the composition of the King James and its publication, but they were limited by the text they had available at the time. So usually the answer to any one of these points, like the Mark point or the Mark 16 ending or uh, the passage about the woman caught in sin in John, all those mm -hmm. things can be dealt with by just going to James White and some of his debates with the King James only people, where he talks about the different text traditions. Mm -hmm. It seems Francisco agrees with you because he told Fiona Reed and investigate biblical textual criticism recommended Dr. James White. He has excellent work on textual criticism on missing text from Bible versions. Mm -hmm. D.A. Carson also did a book on that, by the way. So James White's book on King James only and D.A. Carson's, which is a smaller book, but does equally fine work because he's a New Testament scholar, by the way, from Canada. Good things do come from Canada. Mm. <laughs> Anna says, when JWs aren't sure what to do and want to leave, they should remember the right to apply Matthew 18, 15 to 17 belongs to the faithful Christian, not the governing body, when the elders call you to a judicial committee. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew 18, we, we have done a video on that passage because that's one of the two main the only two passages where Christ actually mentions church by name, that is Ecclesia. And yes, discipline is, is, is one of the things he talks about in that passage of if your brother sins against you, but it's the church that does the judging. That's the point that we took away from it. Mm -hmm. It's the church that does the judging, not the elders. And that's one big difference with the way the watchtower handles issues. Mm -hmm. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Mm. There you go. London says, thank you for reading In Search of Christian Freedom from Ray Franz. It has been so relaxing, healing, and helped me with the anxiety and pain of the process of fading. And I can say that's how I found you guys because I was currently researching Raymond Franz and you guys popped up and I started mm -hmm. to listen to you there. So that's how I got introduced to you through those videos. Uh -huh. Ray is blessed. I don't know how many tens of thousands of people, eh, Lori? Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of it is is his his um, tone in his books. He's very um, kindly gentle. and gentle. He's not accusing anyone. He's he's very fair minded. So that's what appealed to me about his books. They weren't vindictive. They weren't angry. He sounds like a true Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David and Vivian, I found that most, if not all, Watchtower's false teachings come from theosophy. Have you found this connection? Maybe you could define that for us, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, theosophy is a very influential movement, but it's it's generated more influence in the last 50 or so years than it did in its first, well, 100 years. So Madame Blavatsky and Rudolf Steiner are two of the names uh, identified with that that movement and they divided of course as all these groups tend to and, and with acrimony at that but yes a lot of their beliefs ended up in the new age movement they're occultic and they oppose the basic teachings of of christianity and basically say that we can have a direct route to god and all of that stuff is now filtered into our general culture as to the connection direct connection with the the watchtower well i guess we could go point by point Yes, they share several doctrines with the Watchtower, but that would be a that would be a, a, a video a video by itself. That we'll have to do. <laughs> I just have to tell you guys: Are you are you holding up okay? I've never done an interview this long. I'm fine to keep going, but yeah, we've got I'm, I'm tons okay. of questions. There are 66 people watching wow. live asking questions. Wow. I think that's an all time high. So, how's your endurance, Laura? Yeah, oh, how I'm are good. You? I'm good. My kids, if you see me going like this, it's me saying to the kids, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie yeah. said, 
being born in was such a struggle for me to get past what they etched in my young mind. You guys helped me so much. And I thank you. I think that's the blessing of the internet being able to just, you know, yeah. type in, you know, even if you get like a, a, a secondary YouTube account, hint, hint. <laughs> so people don't <laughs> know to explore these things. It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. And then you realize there, there, yeah. Yes, there are some evil apostates, but most of us are wonderful Christian people. <laughs> and like I like to say that we didn't apostatize from the true teachings of Christ. Yeah. We might have we, we might have apostatized from the organization called Jehovah's Witnesses. And I even say if I if and when probably more like when I get disfellowshipped and they make the announcement that I'm no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I still have a problem with that because I witness about Jehovah every day and Jesus <laughs> and the truth. I'm just not in association with Watchtower yes. Bible and Tract Society. So, you know, don't don't play by their rules. If you go to the grocery store and you see one of them and you're disfellowshipped, wave high because that's what <laughs> Christians are supposed to do. And if they don't, then that's on them and it'll make them think about it more. Don't Don't put your head low. Hold your head high. I think we should underline your, the point you just made too, Lori, that the Watchtower apostatized. Mm -hmm. It was an apostate movement when it started mm -hmm. yeah. because they had separated. Nelson Barber, who was Charles Taze Russell's mentor, had separated from the churches. The Christadelphians and the Seventh-day Adventists he was hanging out with and interacting with. But but no, the, the, the doctrines of Christendom were rejected, left mm -hmm. behind. So the apostasy was the cults. And, yeah. and of course, they all went in their own directions. And they teach a lot of stuff that is in conflict with each other, but they all oppose the church. So the separation, which is the root meaning, by the way, of the word heresy, it doesn't mean wrong doctrines. That's a that's a derivative meaning. The, the original meaning is separated. The yeah. ones who separate themselves, the ones who go out from us mm -hmm. because they're not of us, in the words of First John chapter 2. Mm -hmm. All right, Sean said, you mentioned God's economy. Have you read the book? I'm not sure. I wasn't referring to a specific book. I was talking more about the original sense of the word economy, the God's government of the universe, as it were. Is a book you don't know household. about, David? I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't read it. I don't think I've read a book called God's Economy. There's a lot of good ones, though. Jacques Alola has written a lot because he's a great sociologist. And mm -hmm. some of the guys in the, in the Calvinist camp called the, uh, what are they called? The Reconstructionists, that's how they're usually referred to. The Reconstructionist camp of Calvinism are really good with economics. Some of them are ec economists. So there's a lot of good stuff out there, all right. Catholics are writing some great stuff mm -hmm. on, on this, too. Got a shout out from Canty. <clears throat> Canty. Oh, hi, Canty. Hi, Canty. One of our oldest, <laughs> one of our oldest friends from, Lovely to 30, hear from 30 you. years ago. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have to apologize because it, I'm not looking my nose down at you guys, but I'm old and I wear bifocals and we're just the wrong distance. <laughs> That's why we're doing this all the time. So, yeah, David goes like this. You're fine. And I go <laughs> like this. So I'm just apologizing. <laughs> Kevin says, hi, guys. Explain why the 70-year prophecy of Babylonian captivity doesn't have to end in 537. Well, 537. Hence doesn't have to start in 607 not return yeah. to but rebuilding jerusalem 1914 wrong open my eyes <laughs> oh wow <laughs> well kevin <laughs> hi kevin did, did we say hello to canthy i yeah i did <laughs> and uh canthy was kicked out by the way many years ago and found himself on the streets that's how we first met him that he'd been mm. scholarshiped as a teenager and uh he was trying to put his life back together Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin's question, uh, the 70 years, we could recommend to everybody that you get as basic library, the Gentile Times Reconsidered mm -hmm. by Carl Olaf Johnson. It's gone through several editions. I have the oldest one, so I'm not the best on this subject, but I can say he does a thorough job of showing that there's at least three 70 year periods overlapping each other. One mm -hmm. is from the beginning of the Babylonian dynasty. And the other one is the is the exile of the Jews in the in Babylon. So the 70 year dynasty of Babylon is 70 years long. The the exile of the Jews, but that's not from the destruction of the temple. That's the one the what watchtower is fixed on. 
the destruction of the temple to the restoration in 537, they say. But there's a third one that they ignore almost totally, which is the temple was destroyed, but not in 607, in 587 or 586, and it was restored in 516. According to the book of Haggai and Zechariah, it was restored in 516. And if you look at Zechariah chapter 1 and chapter 7, you can see in those two chapters that they're still counting the 70 years mm -hmm. in, in the in the reign of Darius, which is from 520 onwards. They're still counting the 70 years. So that's the one that I think is the most important because it's the fulfillment of Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9, the mm -hmm. exile end, not just the exile end, but the temple, temple worship be restored in Jerusalem. And do you go over this in your Daniel videos? Yeah, somewhat. Yeah. But this and, is not and there's at least two videos that that are just if you just put in 607, you should find some videos. on Yeah. That. Yeah. If you type in 607 on our channel, there's, I think, two or three. But the, mm -hmm. one is, uh, is Ray Franz's take on this because he's the one who yeah. uncovered. Well, it was the first chink in his armor. Right. It was mm -hmm. that when he discovered that they were wrong about that. Mm -hmm. And then they got, of course, Carl F. Johnson's research, which got him this fellowship. Mm -hmm. They realized that there was a cover up going on. I e we we got to cling to this because 1914. Well, everything depends on 1914. That's and it, in our 200-page uh, documentation, I think David reads some of the research he did on 607. So there's a video called 607. 607, 607 witnesses, witnesses, witnesses against the Watchtower. Yeah. Oh. Like, which, which is a so, list of 607 scholars from every stripe uh, in, in the world who, who, wow. who give you their dates. And none of them is anywhere close to 607. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you come to their David and Vivian's channel and in the little um, magnifying glass type in 607, you'll see all the different videos they've done where they have that in the title. So the top mm -hmm. three have 607 in it, 1914. Mm -hmm. So... They, but you guys are Johnson, prolific. Carl Olaf Johnson, though, is the definitive statement. We can't do anything like that yeah. because he spent a lot of years on that project. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's see. Quincy, you two are a huge blessing. Max, too. Shout out <laughs> to Max. This has been a great conversation to listen in on. I think so, too. Thank you. This Anna's is our old, our old landlord. <laughs> And, oh, our, okay. and our pastor from Brampton. Yeah. <laughs> Quincy. Hi. Say hello to everybody. <laughs> and Anna's saying she's looking forward to your video, video on theosophy. If you do one, I guess that's a hint. Um, I appreciate that David doesn't, do, doesn't try to get a following, just give their point of view. Christians are in all denominations. Miguel. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's something that I, I don't think we've done a video that does justice to this yet, but we did try. That is the, the Matthew 13 parables, the seven parables. We did a video or two or three on the first two of the parables. And if you get that in your head, that Christ said, this is the kingdom from now on. The kingdom is like a sower who went out to sow. And then, of course, the second parable is about the, the wheat the and the weeds. weeds. So if you get those two concepts in your head, Mm -hmm. You're cured of this looking for a perfect church syndrome that so many of us are prone to, even after we leave the watchtower. And there's, if, there's no perfect church. And if not that, just read the book of Corinthians and you'll soon see there's no perfect church. Or Revelation 1 to 3. We've done a series on that too. The Revelation mm -hmm. cures, cures us of, of that, but who pays attention to the first three chapters of Revelation? <laughs> it's the only ones I would read at the beginning. <laughs> Canty asks, what's the Watchtower's explanation in regards to their this generation 1914 teaching? Have they changed the meaning or definition of this generation? Oh, boy, yeah. have they. Have they. <laughs> yes, they have. Now they yeah. have overlapping generations so they can cover more time. Well, of course, that's, diagrams that's, and everything. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel competent even to deal with that because that's all happened since we left. It all yeah. happened in the, the 1990s and through to yeah. what, four years ago, five years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go to the, the wol.jw.org, you can do research and all the stuff to see what their latest teachings are if you have the stomach for it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. By the way, the very and first Watch Star publication I read after the Paradise book. Remember the Paradise book, everybody? The mm -hmm. that orange book that they published in the late fifties that had all those gruesome pictures of crevices. Paradise Lost, yeah. People dropping down crevices in children and cars and everything going down the hole. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the book, the very first Watch Star publication I saw, and it stuck with me when I was a kid. But the first one I read was Is It Later Than You Think? the October 8, 1968 special issue that they used to put out every October for, and then do a special campaign with it, right? Mm -hmm. And that was the one where they laid out the 1975 scenario. Very, so, so I was kind of set up for a fall when I saw, wow, we got seven years. This is 68 when that came out. So we got seven years to the end. And of course they can capitalize on that kind of urgency. Mm. Anna says, we became apostates to the watchtower. The Jehovah's Witnesses are referred to in Isaiah were the house of Jacob from which the prophet Daniel came. We are not apostate to him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. It's endearing to see how warm a reception you two receive from so many different people. Truly a testimony to your character transformation and ability to reach the heart and not merely the head. Thanks, mm -hmm. Grace Maid. Mm -hmm. In response to what Anna just said, I think that maybe we should underline that scripture too. Isaiah 43, you are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, even my servant whom I have chosen. Well, if you read that whole chapter, and I, I encourage you to use it with witnesses, and with, with because it's such an identity, it's a bad chapter. But if you read it just before, from the beginning of 43, and then after the passage that you quote all the time, who are the witnesses? Well, they're people who are unfaithful to God. They're blind They're and blind deaf. They're blind and deaf in so the context. So do they want to be identified that way? Do they even notice that's in the passage? So it's obviously Israel in all its unfaithfulness in the text itself. Mm -hmm. Just Chillin says, I'm still stuck on Vivian's last video about what sin is defined as, as used in the Bible, as well as death. It really shines light on the freedom of choice confusion. Mm. Mm. Um. <laughs> I, I, in that video, I defined sin the way I did for my Sunday school kids was the shortest definition of sin is I will. And, uh, and then the, the watchtowers was missing the mark. And then somebody else, who was it? Oh, it was uh, Wenham himself talking about it being basically putting your will ahead of God's will. Mm. You know, those those were the definitions that we just I discuss in that video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lori says, "May I say I love seeing David and Vivian in living color." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. We get we get a few complaints about the black and white, but there's more mm -hmm. there's more praise. People kind of like it, and then we can credit Max with that choice because once once he f fixed that that was going to be the policy, he wanted to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was his choice. An artist. It's your choice. shtick. Yep. <laughs> yeah, makes us unique. If you want to see them in color, you'll have to attend their Bible studies. <laughs> <laughs> Just chilling. I never knew about 1975 until Whoopi Goldberg mentioned it on The View. When I asked my father, he said the same thing. A few were promoting that idea. So we did put this in the, yeah. the invitation that went out. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about 1975. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think in, in one of the videos, um, I, t I talk about, even in, in my own testimony, I talk about how they, they rewrite their own history. So with the 1975, they try and play it out as if they did not say anything that encouraged people to think 1975 was it. But you just have to read their literature to know that they did. You know, all the it's it's a delusion to say that they had no part in this and it was other people. They just end up blaming their own followers for believing them. I think if you go to YouTube and search on Stay Alive until 75, there's a recording of um, what was his name? Well known, high up brother, basically saying, you know, mm. encouraging people to get ready for it. So. Yeah. Um, let's see. We're going to do one more. Oops. Well, here's a 
Just a little nice comment. I'm serious. Love you guys. See you soon. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Asheroska. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I thought we were done, and then everyone's jumping back on again. These guys are just... In, <laughs> we might have to have, do it part two. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes, definitely. Um, Richard says, Jesus criticized the Jewish religious leaders to go to Gehenna. Do you think the governing body members are subject oh. to Gehenna? Ooh. Oh, that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's a tough one because, yeah, yeah, the doctrine of accountability in the scriptures is so strong, whether you take the view of eternal punishment or, mm -hmm. or, or be getting retribution for your sins like John Wenham and several others tend to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the books we've looked at lately in one of our Sunday studies is, is a book by a fellow called Edward Fudge. Mm -hmm. who wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes. He, he is what is known as a conditionalist. He believes that there's going to be retribution, perhaps, for punishment exact according to your sins, and you'll get all the rewards because there's many scriptures about that, people being rewarded according to what they do, good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. Many scriptures. And, of course, there's Jesus' famous statement about the resurrection of, the, of those who are just and unjust, in John 5, Paul also said something like that in Acts. But but the idea that you have to get the measure of punishment that your sins deserve. So how, how do you measure the punishment for the governing body members? Ray Franz is, I, I kind of like Ray's attitude, though, which is he's cutting them slack, too. I, I don't like the tendency in a lot of the XJW sites that are very negative to yeah. judge the men as if they are deliberately doing what they're doing. Ray, Ray doesn't believe that about the governing body in his day. They're deluded mm. as, as we were deluded. A lot of them, like Ray did himself, just come up from grassroots and got to a higher position. So a, a lot of them, I would say, in, in leadership positions in the Watchtower are just... Organization men. Yeah, they've just followed the same trek we would follow, trying to go up. Ray says, the they're, they're, Ray says they're captive to a concept. Yeah, that's mm. exactly right. So yeah. I don't know about these eight men. I don't know what their, their, the state of their souls is, but their judgment is just as skewered as the guys that Ray France had to deal with he, himself. Mm -hmm. he, he admits that he was in this mindset himself yeah. for mm -hmm. 50 years of his life. Yeah. Yeah. I believed it totally when I was a witness. <laughs> yep. Did you watch any XJW channels? Well, no, because YouTube didn't come out till 2005 yeah. or eight or something like that. <laughs> but when, you do now. Yeah. When we first, My. Uh, when we first decided to do it, well, that's when we kind of started to look around to see what was out there. And so we watched Cedars and, and we watched uh, uh, Christian and, and Katya. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and a, f a few others that we, we mm -hmm. found. And, uh, yeah, so. But, you know, uh, I had read, do you remember back in the day, Richard will remember this, back in the day in the 1970s, the most famous book about the Watchtower, on the one hand, was Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. That was a doctrinal analysis. But the most famous testimony was a guy called Schnell, 30 years a Watchtower slave. Mm -hmm. And a Christian had given me that even before I got baptized. I read it as a favor to him, and it rocked me really bad. But because Schnell didn't deal with the badge issues that Daniel, the book of the Daniel playlist deals with, the name, mm -hmm. the name, the kingdom, and 1914, he didn't really deal with those effectively. So when I got over the initial shock of reading the book about their history, which is quite open about Rutherford's failings mm -hmm. and Ru Ru Russell's false prophecies, I still got baptized. I think I remember you saying too that the tone of the book kind of put you out yeah. and, and you just felt like, well, it's not the kind of people I remember or that mm -hmm. I've met in the Watchtower. They all seem very nice, you know, so it didn't seem to ring true mm -hmm. because he focused on, on really harsh negative. I oftentimes think when you, when you first leave the witnesses, that's probably not the right time to either write a book or start a yeah. channel, like not write out because you're angry <laughs> and that will come out and it'll show on your, on your, uh, I waited a year. I did it on my year yeah. anniversary. Yeah. 
I mean, we used to uh, do classes with Christians, telling them how to how to talk to witnesses, how to treat them. Uh, and then, you know, I remember that one day when David came home from work and he worked nights as a security guard and there were witnesses outside just as he came out and he chased them down the street, talking at them, <laughs> yelling at them. I don't know what, but I, I didn't follow was, my own advice. Yeah. Because you, your emotion just gets in the way. <laughs> yeah. You're so mad and it's so pent up in you that even when you don't, when you know it's the wrong thing to do, you still will do it sometimes because mm -hmm. it's it's just you're very angry when you leave the world. If they had wrong beliefs, it would just be one thing, but it's this shunning. The, mm -hmm. That's a part that makes people yeah. so angry and rightfully so. And, you, yeah. and you, just, you want them to get out, but your your mm -hmm. approach is not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, just Chillin says, is there delusion, meaning the governing body, a subject of discussion that you'd be willing to change your mind on? The reason I ask is because of the way they defend themselves in court and the seemingly deceptive way they create their videos. It seems like something has changed within the last few years. Well, yeah, I guess it's possible to change our mind on it because I don't know these men. I And, and in mm -hmm. Ray Franz's case, I only know the men that he knew secondhand through him and a couple yeah. of other references. But I, mm -hmm. I did meet a few of the heads up back in the day, mm -hmm. 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And the ones I had dealings with were, were nice men doing their best mm -hmm. within the limits of their understanding. And I, I like to think, like Ray, Ray does, that that's still the case. But yeah, it may have changed just in the yeah. last few years. For all and I think in in our day too, the 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 governing body were were invisible. You know, you mm -hmm. didn't know what they looked like, and you had this this thing in your head that they were like gurus reading their Bibles and praying every night and listening to all the voices of the letters that came in from everybody that was of the hundred forty four thousand. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. that's a nice kind of. Uh, visual. Yeah, it's a visual that makes you put faith in them. I think it was a big mistake for them to actually show themselves. Yes. Because, yes. Uh, you know, they look almost cartoonish. And then you think, well, he doesn't seem very knowledgeable or he doesn't seem very <laughs> spiritual. It, you know, I think it was a big mistake. Well, yeah. on their part, but it's great for Do us. Do you guys <laughs> keep up with the, um, the, br the broadcast and things like that? No. no, we never no, watch them don't. except if someone refers them to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No time. It's, no. I, I would say they're very different than what Ray describes. Yeah. And I, we just, there's so much change since those articles where they came out and said that the faithful and discreet slave was just yeah. the eight men, just the governing body. That just shrunk my <laughs> world. And that's when I think, that, that big item went up on the shelf, but I was in the middle of adopting my kids and I didn't really, you know, dig. Mm -hmm. And I never did dig on anything that kind of bothered me. I just, you know. Shelve it for a later yeah. time. It's, yeah, it's, as if, broke. Yeah. it's as if God is exposing them for what they really are. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. in the beginning they were a one man organization and then they continued that way for another 40 years mm -hmm. into the, into the rather, uh, Nathan Noor era. And then they were able to hide it. I think Nathan Noor was a master strategist when it came to selling this thing. And then it started to grow really fast mm -hmm. after Noor took over. Fred Franz was in the in the pocket there doing all of the, the theology. And he was basically regurgitating what he and Rutherford put together in the 30s. Mm -hmm. So so it was a master plan that has failed in the long run because how can, how can they drag out the 120 years that were now past the mm -hmm. Russell era four generations or five, depending mm -hmm. on how you count it. Yeah. So now they've gone back to Russell, Russellism in effect, eight men, one man, but before, in, at least in Ray Francis era, they were hiding behind the idea that there was 144,000 mm -hmm. smart people in the world. And yeah. they were just, they were just filtering it to us. Through the channel. We, we met a, a witness, an ex witness, and he, he gave us a little more of the newer, take on things and the newer ways of looking at things. It, it seemed like another religion to me. I was yeah. quite shocked at the It really does religion. feel like another one. And I've, yeah. I've witnessed it in the last 30 years. I've seen it morph in front of my eyes and now the selling of all these kingdom halls. Yeah. And yeah. you know, it's really happening. So 
At any rate, Asher mm -hmm. says the governing body has the chance still to come clean and admit to themselves the truth and apologize to the millions they actively led and misled. That's what I say, at least even on the, the CSA stuff. If mm. they came out and said, mea culpa, we handled it wrong, you know, because the Bible says we know no one by their fruits and the fruits we're seeing related to that does not yeah. seem Christian to me. We'll keep praying for it, though, because yeah. it did happen at least once. The Worldwide Church of God mm -hmm. right around 1993 to 1995, which had very similar points of view to the Watchtower, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reformed itself from inside without without the pressure of outside mm -hmm. uh, pressure, like sex scandals, etc. Without that, it was just that the men at the top there had some integrity. So yeah. we could pray that the men here who get in control of the Watchtower mm -hmm. might one or two of them be like that. Who knows? Yeah. Well, and the last two comments had to do with not used to seeing you in color and nice to see you in color. So I think color is a hit here. Sorry, sorry, uh, son. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're going to call it here. We've been going two hours and 13 minutes, according to my clock here, but we have even more people. There's 69 people here. <laughs> it's going up. But I think you're right. We need to do a part two. Um, if you guys want me to have David and Vivian back for part two, just, I can't give us a thumbs up, but just say, yes, part two, part two. <laughs> Any yeah. parting words that you want to um, leave? I normally ask my guests if there's one thing that you could share with a new waking up XJW, what would it be? Mm. Well, I guess when we did our video on that subject about two years ago, we titled the video, there is life after the watchtower. And that is, although it took, at least for Vivian, it took several years for her to work through the, the pain. In my case, it was much faster because I read a lot and I was kind of prepared. So I landed mm -hmm. softly compared to most, most people out there. So I guess it would be, be patient and mm -hmm. keep praying to God and keep reading your Bible. Mm -hmm. that, that's what works for almost every, everyone that retains their faith. And then I have Vivian to, Mm -hmm. testify to that right here yeah there there is life after the watchtower and don't uh, you know I went through depression and I think a lot of ex-witnesses seem to go through that depression period don't do anything drastic <laughs> don't uh, think it will never end it does end the pain will end I, I'm not saying that everything will be resolved but the, the pain will lessen I mean I in preparation for this, I watched my own testimony and I cried at the end <laughs> of my own testimony. It's like I'm watching somebody else because yeah. it's, it's so long ago that I felt those things and endured those things that, you know, I, I would say I'm a, I'm a relatively content person now, but I, you know, during that period, I just thought I want to sleep all day. Waking up is a nightmare sleep is my refuge there's i'm never going to be happy again i'm never going to smile again well it wasn't true you know there it, it's there is an end so so just i hope that comforts some people in if they're in that stage that video that went up today uh with vivian and max max when he was about three years old is in mm. the thumbnail and and that's for me a, a testimony to the the pain is worth it because you come out at the other end a better and more dedicated and more serious person, but also the joy. So mm -hmm. I guess the added bit of advice would be be open to teachers. There are tremendous teachers out there in what we yeah. called Christendom, Babylon. There are tremendous teachers out there. And all mm -hmm. you have to do is be, well, don't be fearful. Yeah. Because we will help you collect some books. The, the basic thing <laughs> is get yourself a good Christian library. It doesn't have to be thousands yeah. of books, but if they're the right books, you're you're off and running into don't, the next Don't life. stay isolated. Make friends. Mm -hmm. Well, many votes for part two. We'll have to arrange that. And someone said part two, three, and four. <laughs> 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 Very good. Well, thank you guys so much for, for doing this. And thanks everyone for your enthusiasm and participation. Wow. 
Yes, um, I you. think yeah. I think five o'clock Eastern was a good time slot, but I have a feeling some people are getting home from work and now they're jumping on going, darn, I missed it. So mm. watch the recording and then um, look for the, the announcement next time we do it, maybe in, I don't know, three or four weeks. You think that'd be good, guys? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lori. And, and uh, thanks to everybody. Yes. Good questions. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. God bless. Till next time.